This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play War Room. War Room was released in 2019 by Nightingale Games and designed by Larry Harris Jr. This game supports up to 6 players and takes up to 6 hours or more to play. Welcome back to the Harsh Rules Breakdown for War Room by Nightingale Games. We're going to pick up right where we left off from the last episode and jump into Phase 4 Combat Operations. There's a lot to learn in this phase, so let's get started. While executing orders in the last phase to move units, players placed active hotspot markers in contested territories and sea zones. Now in Phase 4 Combat Operations, Nations will attempt to influence an outcome of the following conflicts and raids. These include air-land battles, strategic bombing raids, air-naval battles, convoy raids, and garrison battles. These combat operations are executed according to a specific order of battle as follows. First, in turn order, each nation selects an active hotspot and then resolves it. The chosen conflict or raid must involve the current nation's forces or territory. As you can see in this example, when it becomes the Soviet Union's turn, they can select to resolve this hotspot. If they don't select this hotspot to resolve, then Germany can select it on their turn, or Italy can select it when their turn comes up. If a nation in the turn order is not involved in any active hotspots on the board, then they must pass. When resolving each hotspot, after a full round of combat is completed, remove that marker from the region if only one side remains. If a territory or region remains contested, then flip the hotspot marker to its embattled side to keep track of this. Now that we know the basics of how a hotspot marker is selected and resolved, let's discuss setting up a battle. In War Room, conflicts are resolved using the game's battle board. The battle board has two sides. One side is used for air and land battles, and the other side is used for air and naval battles. Setting up a battle is conducted in six steps. We'll walk through each of these in just a moment, but for now, let's learn how the battle board works. Now, let's learn the layout of the land side of the battle board. Once players collect the command stacks involved in the battle to be fought, the Axis player will place their forces on the left side of the board, the Allies on the right side. Command stacks are then broken down into their individual components. Place the command tokens on their respective emblems along the middle row of the board. After that, place air units on the top half of the board, land units on the bottom half. You'll notice that each unit type has two lanes. These lanes are used to indicate the unit's stance, which is how they will engage the enemy in battle. Several land units have a choice of either an offensive or defensive stance. Let's look at the armor unit as an example. A unit's stance typically impacts the number of dice that they can roll in battle. The number of dice a unit can roll is shown in two columns running down the center of the battle board. The left column shows how many dice can be rolled against air units in the first stage of battle. These are the circles with numbers inside them. The right column shows the number of dice that can be rolled against land units in the second stage of battle. These are the squares with numbers inside them. You'll notice that the shape corresponds to the unit type. Circle for air units, square for land units. Depending on a unit's stance, Air and surface units may participate in either or both stages. However, be aware that casualties can only be inflicted on units of their respective stage. In other words, air units can only be hit during the air battle stage, and surface units, whether they be land or naval units, can only be hit during the surface battle stage. A quick note. Bombers also have a stance to conduct a strategic bombing raid. Each bomber in this stance may roll four dice to target their opponent's units under construction, their resource stockpile, or the territory's infrastructure and industry. 
Although this icon is shown in the second battle stage column, strategic bombing raids are resolved between the air battle stage and the surface battle stage. Therefore, bombers must survive the air battle stage to conduct their strategic bombing raid. This rule is true of all units passing between stages. They must survive a stage to participate in the next stage. Now let's focus on the two armor lanes again. An offensive armor stance allows units in that lane to roll four dice versus other land units. In the second stage of battle, the surface battle stage. However, a defensive stance allows an armor unit to participate in both stages of a battle. An armor unit can roll one dice in the first stage of battle, the air battle stage, and two dice in the second stage of battle, the surface battle stage. Now, another difference that you'll notice in the defensive stance is that the armor unit has an extra box with a tank in it. These boxes correspond to the unit's health. Most lanes are divided into three spaces to track this. A full health initial status, then when a unit is hit, it is moved to a damage space with a white triangle and a cross. And if it is hit again, it is moved to a final space where it's eliminated. The armor unit, though, has an extra space. This is for the tank's armor, known as the lightly damaged space. Therefore, the armor unit in a defensive stance can take two hits before it's moved to the damage space. We will discuss the multicolored custom dice in just a moment, but basically, if the color of the die result matches the unit, then it's considered a hit. The current dice roller, the player attacking, assigns hits to enemy units. When a unit is hit, it is moved one space closer to the eliminated box. However, it's very important to note that only one unit can inhabit the damage boxes in its lane. Therefore, a unit in a damage box must be hit and moved to the next box before another full strength unit in that lane can be assigned a hit. Let's look at a quick example on the allied side of the battle board. I'm going to place two armor units in the defensive lane. Now, let's walk through the mechanics for absorbing hits. Let's say the Axis player is rolling dice for their attack and roll three green die results. Each green die result equals a hit. Therefore, the armor units in the defensive lane must absorb these hits. The first armor unit absorbs a hit and is moved to the lightly damaged box. Now. The next hit cannot be assigned to the full strength armor unit because the lightly damaged box is occupied. Therefore, the next hit must be used to move that armor unit to the damaged box. Then with the final hit, the damaged unit must be moved to the eliminated box. This is due to the rule that a damaged unit must be eliminated before another in the same row can be assigned a hit. Hopefully this explains how assigning hits to units in these lanes work. Now that we have a basic understanding of the battle board's layout, let's look at an example of setting up a battle. In step one of the battle setup, players will determine the nature of the battle to be fought and set the facing of the battle board. This is a land battle, so we're showing the air land side of the battle board. In this example, let's walk through resolving a battle between the Germans teamed up with the Italians versus the Soviets. First, we will break down these command stacks into their individual components. Next, place the command tokens on their flag emblems along the board's middle row. When resolving battles with multiple nations, their colored units are organized in columns above and below their nation's flags. This helps keep units organized. In step 4 of battle setup, players will assign commanders. When multiple nations are involved in a battle, only one player can represent them. In this role, that player is the commander. The commander makes all battle decisions and rolls all dice for this particular conflict. The commander also decides which nation will claim the territory if that side wins the battle and which nation involved receives medals. If there is a disagreement on who this should be, settle it by assigning command based on turn order rank. 
Once any commanders are decided, it's time to assign combat stances. Finally, in step 6, players will note advantages. Arrow tags can be placed to keep track whether each side has force advantage or port advantage. Port advantage refers to naval battles. If a player has a friendly port in the battle space, then they can repair ships at no cost at the end of the battle. More importantly, they also receive two additional dice to roll in combat. Force advantage is checked during the surface battle stage. The player with more land or naval types in the battle receive force advantage, and the player with fewer types are penalized with black and white die results being misses. We'll discuss force advantage more in just a moment. Now that the battle is set up, let's begin with the first stage of battle, the air battle stage. This conflict begins with the air battle stage. So now, players need to calculate the number of dice they get to roll. To do this, players multiply the number of units in each row by the circled number in the center column. Now, although the allies have aircraft in the battle, there are no Axis aircraft to target. Remember, only air units can be hit during the air battle stage, therefore the allies do not need to calculate dice. However, the Axis have an artillery unit in an anti-air stance, so they do get to make the calculation. The Axis player finds the circled number in the center column and multiplies it by the number of units in that lane. To keep track of the number of dice they get to roll, players use hotspot markers on the numbered edge of the battle board. After that, it's time to roll the dice. The Axis player is the only one with dice, so they get to roll. When both sides roll dice, the player that comes first in turn order gets to roll their dice first. Dice are rolled in batches of 10. One player rolls 10 dice, and then another player rolls 10 dice, and back and forth until all dice have been rolled. The maximum number of dice a player can roll is 30. Keep that in mind because if you bring extra units, they're just going to end up being targets. The Axis player rolls their dice and they roll a green and a yellow. The Axis player is attacking, so they get to decide where to apply hits. In this example though, there is only one hit to apply, and one unit to apply it to. Therefore, the Allied Fighter is moved to the damaged box. Now, even though the Allied Fighter suffered a hit, it can still participate in the next stage of battle. Had it been hit twice, it would have been eliminated and not able to participate. And with that, the air stage is complete. Now on to the surface battle stage. For the surface battle stage, we replicate the same process and multiply the number of units in each row, this time by the box number in the center column. When the calculations have been finished, the Axis have enough units for 12 dice and the Allies 21. Once you've added 10 dice, leave the hotspot marker on the 10 space and continue adding dice with a new hotspot marker. Remember, the maximum number of dice a player can roll is 30, so once you have three hotspot markers in the 10 position, that side is maxed out. Now that it's the surface battle stage, remember to check for force advantage. Force advantage applies if one side has more land or naval unit types. Basically, you count the number of colors for each side at the bottom of the board. If one side has more colors than the other side, then they have force advantage, and the side with fewer colors, or types, will roll a miss with black and white die results. And now that we're on the topic of dice, let's learn how they work. War Room comes with 10 custom 12-sided dice to resolve battles. Each side shows one of six colors. The colors are yellow, blue, green, red, black, and white. The die results are always organized and resolved in this sequence. If you or a player in your group has color blindness, Nightingale Games has added markings to allow you to differentiate colors and organize them into the proper sequence. As far as statistics go, there are four yellow sides, three blue sides, two green, one red, one black, and one white. These battle dice are typically used in the game for standard combat and strategic bombing raids. First, let's discuss standard combat. 
Standard combat is focused on eliminating enemy units. The color of the die result corresponds with the color of the unit. For example, when resolving a yellow die result, this will score a hit on a yellow infantry unit or a yellow submarine. A yellow submarine. Really, Larry? <clears throat> anyway, the remainder of the colors follow this pattern. Blue will hit an artillery unit or a cruiser. Green will hit an armor unit or an aircraft carrier or a fighter. Red will hit a battleship or a bomber. But what about black and white? These are wild results. Black can be used to score a hit on any unit. However, with force advantage in play, this will be treated as a miss for the player with less unit types. White can be used to score a hit on any damaged unit. Once again though, if force advantage is in effect, the player with less unit types scores a miss with this die result. Once you get the hang of it, resolving die results is pretty straightforward. Now let's discuss die results with strategic bombing raids. With strategic bombing raids, each successful hit may allow a player to eliminate a unit under construction, deplete one resource, or take out a region's infrastructure. Let's walk through the die results to see how this works. With a yellow die result, a player may choose to eliminate an infantry unit, presumably in basic training, or a submarine under construction, or they may deplete one OSR resource. Depleted resources are subtracted from available resources on the targeted player's resource chart. A blue hit may take out an artillery unit or a cruiser under construction, or deplete one iron resource. Green hits destroy an armor unit or an aircraft carrier or a fighter under construction. Red destroys a battleship or a bomber under construction or depletes an oil resource. Now. What about black and white die results? With a black die result, the player may choose to eliminate one unit under construction or deplete one resource or take out the region's infrastructure, which is the white die result's purview. A strategic bombing raid white die result destroys all infrastructure in the region. When a territory's infrastructure is hit, place a bomb token to keep track of this. This means that, effective immediately, ports lose their port advantage, but are otherwise functional, and there can be no rail movement into or out of the territory. If the region has industry, each bomb token permanently reduces that territory's production output by one, basically negating a smokestack. Use multiple bomb tokens to keep track of industry damage. A captured territory that is bombed will remain damaged, Bomb tokens are never removed. A quick note, there is no need to place more than one bomb token in a territory except for those territories with industries. Next, let's discuss battles that take place in territories without defending units. In War Room, empty territories controlled by an opposing nation or neutral territories that have had their defense force eliminated still have a last line of defense known as a garrison force. Battles with garrisons are not conducted using the battle board. Instead, they are resolved by rolling two battle dice. If the die results are the same color, then a unit type of that color is eliminated. Let me be very clear on this. Regardless of the unit type, it is immediately moved to the eliminated box. Black die results are wild. They can be paired with yellow, blue, green, or red to produce a hit. White die results are considered misses. After this exchange, the territory will be captured if any invading land units remain. Now, you should know enough about dice results and setting up the battle board to conduct a land battle. Let's turn our attentions to see what the difference is with a naval battle. The naval side of the battle board functions nearly the same as the land side with a few exceptions. First of all, if any land commands acting as transports are in the same region where a battle occurs at sea, they are left on the game board. Their fate will be decided by the player that wins the naval battle. 
As for the battle board, once again, naval battles are divided into two stages, an air battle stage and a surface battle stage. Since these battles take place at sea, there are no strategic bombing raids to resolve between stages. Naval battles also have advantages. If a nation has a friendly port in the region, then they gain a port advantage. This grants the player two extra dice for the battle and free naval unit repairs afterwards. Force advantage is also in play. The player with fewer surface unit types will miss on black and white die results. Most of the stances on the naval side of the board allow units to participate in both stages to varying degrees. And several naval stances have lightly damage box to allow naval vessels to take multiple hits. However, there are two unique stances that we need to cover. The escort stance allows a cruiser to take hits, including white or black hits, that would normally be assigned to a carrier or a battleship. Blue hits for cruisers are always resolved before green aircraft carrier units or red battleship units are hit. Therefore, cruisers that want to use their escort ability must survive first. A damaged cruiser may still use this ability, but if the escorting cruiser is sunk, then the ability is lost. Also note that allies can use this stance to protect each other's units. The ability is not limited to units within a specific nation. Another unique aspect of the naval battle board regards submarines. If a submarine is hit, it is moved to its own dive box. The dive box recognizes that the submarine is under fire and is attempting to escape. If a submarine in the dive box is hit again, it will be eliminated like other units. Although, submarines in the dive box are not susceptible to white die result hits for damaged units. After each batch of enemy dice is rolled, submarines in the dive box will flee the battle, thereby avoiding further damage entirely and the need for repair. Move such escaped submarines to the escaped area after each batch of dice hits are fully assigned. Next, let's look at another unique battle situation that occurs at sea. Throughout the world's oceans are convoy clusters. These are color-coded ship silhouettes encircled by one or more rings. These convoys are shipping fleets transporting a nation's natural resources, such as OSR, iron, and oil. These convoys can be raided once per round, and no orders are required. If an air or naval force is in a sea region with an active enemy convoy, and there are no defending naval or air units present from the very start of Phase 4 combat operations, then place a hotspot marker in the region to indicate a raid must be resolved during that phase. If defenders are in the region, then no raiding may occur, even after a battle is resolved. Troop transports do not act as defenders and may be sunk in addition to a convoy raid occurring in the sea region. Convoy clusters come in two types, trans-ocean convoys and coastal convoys. Let's walk through each type. Coastal convoys are convoy clusters linked to certain ports on the world map. The nation that controls the linked territory also controls the coastal convoy, and will suffer any resource losses due to a raid. Coastal convoys are always active. Transocean convoy clusters bear a national flag and labels for its territories of origin and destination. If both territories are controlled by nations of the same alliance, the convoy is active and may be raided by the opposing alliance. If two Axis nations control these territories, though, they must decide amongst themselves which nation places its national flag to denote control and suffer the liability. If the territories are controlled by opposing nations, the convoy is inactive and may not be raided. Now, let's discuss resolving a convoy raid. Each convoy cluster may only be raided once each round, and each command may raid only one convoy cluster in its region. When carrier fighters are in play, they are considered to be an individual command for this purpose. If multiple friendly commands target the same cluster, they conduct one raid together, choosing a commander if necessary. 
To resolve each rated cluster, the attacker rolls one die per air or naval unit in batches of up to 10 in the rating command. The color of the die result must match the color of the transport in the cluster. Each transport represents one point of resources for that nation. For example, three yellow transports represents three points of OSR for the nation controlling the convoy. It's important to note that a color result needs to be rolled only once to affect all convoy ships of that color. So if there are three yellow transports, one yellow die result will take out all three. Green and white die results are considered misses. And black die results are wild and may be applied to any color of transport in the cluster. However, there are loss limits for raids. A territory can't lose more total resources of each type than it currently produces from a single raid attack. This includes strategic bombing raids and convoy raids. Now that we've seen all the different conflicts and raids, let's see what happens after a battle. Once all stages of a battle are completed, it's time for the battle debrief phase. To complete a battle debrief, players will need the morale board. There are two versions of the morale board configured for specific scenarios. One for the Europe and Pacific scenarios, and a second for the Global and Eastern Front scenarios. Which scenario the board goes with is identified in the upper right hand corner. For this example, we will need the morale board for the Global scenario. Throughout this phase, players will clean up the battle board, update the main board and possibly the card holders, and transfer casualties to the morale board to calculate stress. This phase is completed in seven lettered steps. First, players assess unit status and pay for repairs. Then, remove eliminated units. After that, if it's a naval battle, they check for lost troop transports. Then they return surviving command stacks to the world map, update territory card status, assign stress and medals, and update the hotspot marker. Let's walk through these steps to understand the tasks that must be completed. I've advanced our example to the end of the battle to illustrate the battle debrief process. Let's begin with step A, assess unit status and pay for repairs. In this phase, players review their unit's health and decide which units they can save. To make this easier to understand, I'm going to bring up the health color grid again. Units in an initial status box, or a lightly damaged box, the green areas, are fine. Later they will be restacked under their command token and returned to the main board. Units in the red eliminated boxes can't be saved. They're gone, and will be moved to the morale board for stress calculation. Damaged units, the yellow zones, linger between life and death. Players have one last chance to save them with the repair option. Repairing each unit costs one resource of any type. Once repairs are paid for, move the unit back to the initial status box. If the player elects not to spend money on repairs or can't afford to, then the unit succumbs and is moved to the eliminated box. During a naval battle, if a player has port advantage, they can repair their damaged ships for free, which is a big help. In our example here, repairing the artillery and infantry units in the damage box is a critical decision for the Axis player. If these units are repaired to initial status, the territory will remain contested. This will delay the Soviets occupying the territory for at least another turn. If these units are allowed to die, however, then the Soviets can claim the territory. For the sake of drama, let's say the Axis player can't afford to save them and they succumb to their injuries. Before we get ahead of ourselves, let's conduct a brief overview of the morale board. The morale board is used to manage a nation's stress. Each nation has a stress threshold, which is displayed on the left side of the board. Later in phase 6, when accumulated stress is applied, and if this threshold is exceeded, that nation's homeland status will decline by a level. Now, most of the morale board is used to calculate stress from unit casualties as a result of battles. In step B of the battle debrief, eliminated units are removed from the battle board and placed on the appropriate unit image in the nation's row. 
At this time, you will also want to check for any troop transports that were lost as the result of a naval battle. This is what the Soviet, German, and Italian rows would look like after our battle example. Each of these units generates casualty points based on their unit type. The value of each unit can be seen at the top of the column. In Phase 6, Morale, these unit casualties will be multiplied by these values and the total points will be compared to the table at the top of the morale board. This table tells players the conversion rate for casualty totals to stress tokens. Once stress tokens are generated, they're placed next to their nation's threshold rating. Later, players are allowed to use medals they've won in battles or civilian goods to counteract stress tokens. After that is done, the revised casualty tokens are compared to the stress thresholds and homeland status is evaluated. In Step D of the Battle Debrief, Restack surviving units under their command tokens to form command stacks and return them to the world map. The Soviet land and air units can be rejoined with their respective command tokens and returned to the board. As for the German 91st and Italian 109th land commands, they have no surviving units. They are returned to their respective player areas where they can be reused later in the game. The goal of Step E is to update the territory's status, which means determining which nation controls the territory at the end of the battle. A nation gains control of an enemy territory if its alliance is the only force with at least one surviving land unit. Otherwise, if both sides still have land units, or neither side does, the control of the territory does not change hands. Air commands by themselves cannot capture or hold a territory. If the territory is captured and there are multiple nations on the victorious side, the commander decides which of these nations will be the new controller, as long as that nation has at least one surviving land unit. If control of a territory changes, the former controlling nation surrenders the territory card to the new controller. If control doesn't change and enemy units remain in the territory, be sure that the embattled side of the territory card is face up. When reviewing territory status after a battle, players may need to replace or retain the national flag. If control changes, the national flag on the territory is changed. If the new controller is the original controller, as indicated by map color, simply remove all flags. Otherwise, remove the current flag, if any, and replace the new controller's flag on the territory. Next, players should check for captured units. When a territory produces new units, an industry token is placed on top of them. If a territory changes hands, any units under that industry token are also captured and will be deployed under the new ownership during Phase 5 Refit and Deploy. A quick note, China never captures air or naval units, such units are removed to storage. And finally, if the alliance that does not control the territory has only air commands remaining, those commands will either need to be moved to a friendly territory, this occurs during Phase 5, or be eliminated. Remember to place arrow tags on all air commands that conduct combat or movement as a reminder. In Step F, players assign stress and award medals. If a territory is captured or recaptured, the victorious commander chooses which friendly participating nation or nations are awarded medals. Medals may be awarded to a participating nation even if all of its units present were eliminated. A nation receiving medals needn't be the ones taking control of the territory. Medals are never awarded for capturing neutrals. There are two medal awards for capturing or recapturing a territory. If the territory was a non-capital, then award one medal. If the territory was a capital, then award three medals. Awarded medals are added to the far left column of the morale board. Next, it's time to add any stress that occurred from the battle. There are three ways to receive stress. If a player lost a territory, they receive stress equal to the territory's strategic value. If a neutral territory was invaded for the first time, that nation receives one point of stress. And finally, if the action caused the Japanese-Soviet non-aggression pact to be broken, the first nation to do so receives six stress. 
Stress tokens are placed on the newspaper spaces next to the nation's flag on the morale board. And in the final step of the battle debrief, if the region remains embattled, which means land or naval units remain on both sides, flip the hotspot marker to its embattled side. If only one side controls the territory, remove the hotspot marker. And now that the battle debrief is complete, this ends phase four, combat operations. And I think this is a great spot to end this episode. Stay tuned for the next episode in this Rules Breakdown where we will finish War Room by learning Phases 5, 6, and 7, which will finish off the rules for this game. Before we close out this episode, I'd like to recognize the Harsh Rules Patreon supporters that help make content like this possible. If you'd like to support the channel, head over to patreon.com slash harshrules to learn more. And once again, thank you for your support. If you found this video helpful, please give me a like and share with your friends. To be the first notified when the next episode of Harsh Rules becomes available, please hit the bell icon for notifications. And as always, this is Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.